You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Hi, my name is Dr. Teodros Avery. I'm the professor of jazz studies here at CSU Dominguez Hills. And today is the ninth session of the class entitled Key Movements, The Age of Jazz. Today I'll be speaking about some of the great painters and artists of the Harlem Renaissance. We will cover people such as Romare Bearden and Archibald Motley. There are many other painters during this time, but these are the ones that stand out the most and the ones who've had uh, an effect on painters that came after them. The first painter that we're going to talk about today is uh, Romare Bearden. Romare Bearden was born on September 2nd, 1911 in Charlotte, North Carolina. His art encompasses a broad range of intellectual and scholarly interests, including music, performing arts, history, literature, and world art. Bearden began college at Lincoln University, transferred to Boston University, and graduated at New York University, graduating with a degree in education. After joining the Harlem Artists Guild, Bearden embarked on his lifelong study of art, gathering inspiration from Western masters ranging from Duccio, Giotto, and De Hooch to Cezanne, Picasso, and Matisse as well as from African art, particularly sculptures, masks, and textiles. Also Byzantine mosaics, Japanese prints, and Chinese landscape paintings. Bearden was a prolific artist whose works <clears throat> were exhibited during his lifetime throughout the United States and Europe. His collages, watercolors, oils, photo montages, and prints are imbued with visual metaphors from his past in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and also Harlem, New York, and from a variety of historical, literary, and musical sources. Now we're going to go to the next photo. There's one of his collages right there. And you can see that he was very, very original, very original. One of the most original uh, visual artists of the 20th century. He experimented with many different mediums and artistic styles, but he's best known for his rich, richly textured collages, and that's a collage right there. Now let's go to the next picture. Very nice. Now let's go to the next one. Nice. Now let's go to the next one. Wow. So let's go back to the first one right there, uh, number five. And I'm going to just talk about the process that he used when he created these uh, montages. So what he would do is he would take different pictures from magazines, from newspaper articles, wherever he felt like he saw uh, an image that he liked, and he would cut it with scissors. 
and then he would mix and match them with other shapes and, 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 and images from other mediums. So you, right there you have maybe about, maybe about five different images that are cut up to equal one. So he would use scissors, cut these up, and then he'd stick them onto a canvas. And he'd create the different colors with inks and graphite, often on brown paper. And then he would have someone come in and photograph it. So that you see one side on the left uh, image, the left person, you see the top side of his hair, hair on the left side is from one picture. Then on the top side of the right of his head is from a whole nother picture, equaling one hair top or one top of the head, right? So there's two different people, two different pictures that he, he got hair from. And as you can see, the foreheads are different. One has a receding hairline and the other does not. And then you see his forehead. He's got about three different textures, actually four. Two different pictures that he's coming from. Pieces of a picture, uh, four different pictures added together to equal one forehead. Actually, there's five because there's a greenish one above his uh, right eye. So then the eyes are from two different pictures brought together. And then his skin below his eyes, it's two different pictures mixed together. And then you see his nose. It's one picture on one side, on the left side, but then on the right side, it's a different nose, different half of a, of a nose. And then his cheek on the right side is the same as the nose. So he changed it up there. But those two pieces are from the same picture as the top right side of his head. So you can see those are the same skin tone. Right? And he broke that up in the middle of the uh, cheek with skin from another uh, picture. And then you can see down... His lips, they're all the same. The teeth are all the same. But then the chin is from a whole nother picture. Right? So the chin is from something totally different. And so it's enlarged. It's not, uh, doesn't match everything else in the picture. But I'm sure he did that for a reason. To uh, make you feel something. And then you see the picture on the right side. You've got a hat from one picture, and then between the hat and the forehead, there's that dark space, which I'm not sure what he meant by that, but it's very mystical. You wonder, like, it's mysterious, rather, and you wonder, what does he mean by that? Then you see his forehead. That's all the same, but then the eyes are different. Look at the two different eyes. The one on the left is smaller from something else, and then the one on the right Looks, a more, looks like more of an eye that I've seen before, where the left one looks very different. And then the ears, the two ears are different. You have that ear on the left side that's from like a, a, a almost like a color photo, maybe a magazine photo that he cut out. And then on the right side, you have a gray ear. It's totally different, but they look so uh, unique. And you can see... Uh, you can see the influence of Picasso and Cubism in these pictures. Picasso liked Cubism. Cubism is a, an African uh, art style with, with a lot of geometric shapes. So you can see the influence of Cubism, but then you can also see the influence of Picasso with the colors and the shapes as well. And then on the right side, you have the, the hand coming out from the bottom of the picture coming up. And so he's got his hand on his chin. And then if you see in the background, you see the steps going up on the right side, and then you see a high-rise building on the left side in the background. So that tells you that they're city people. They're in the city part of Pittsburgh. All right, let's go to the next photo. Okay, here you have 
one, two, three, four, five different uh, ladies. And they're, as he says, I believe they're waiting for a train or they're on the train, one or the other. And so they're looking at us. The woman in the middle, she has her whole face. So this is different from the last picture we saw. There's a whole face that he cut out from something. And then in the background, you see a train. And it looks like a train on risers. And so then you look at the woman in the background in the blue. She's peeking through. And these faces are... They appear to me to be the daily lives of faces that he saw because they're not smiling. They're not really posing. They're just kind of looking at us like they're living their lives and we just happened upon them. So they're just lives that he's, that he's seen, that he sees, and he's trying to bring them to life through these pictures. And they look, they look very real because they are photos. Right, which is different from a painting where with a painting, because it is paint and it's not a photo, it looks less real. With these uh, montages, they look very real because they are. They're pictures of people. They're just broken up, cut out, and mixed and, mixed and matched. Let's go to the next picture. Okay. Now here we have colors. Okay, you have the, uh, it's called The Return of the Prodigal Son, 1967, mixed media and collage on canvas. So this is what I was talking about. He put everything on canvas, cut them out, shaded them with different colors, such as uh, graphite and with different inks. And then they took a picture of it, right? So look down in the left corner, you see a person wrapped up in rope. That's, that looks dramatic. Down in the bottom, he's got ropes wrapped around his body and then ropes on his head. I wish I could ask him what that meant. And then look up top, on the top right side, you've got an eye. It appears to be an eye from a fish or from a bird mixed in with human cutouts as well with the black and white hat. So that eye is uh, very unique and I believe it's a bird. Could be a fish too, but that makes everything look different from what we've seen so far. We've always seen face, faces that were cut out from magazines or, or human faces that were cut out. Now we see an animal eye, some kind of animal. And then you see uh, on, the, on the left side, you've got the guy in overalls. His face, at least his eyes are intact. They're, they seem to be the same eyes, but then his lips are from something else. And then you can see his, his arm, the guy on the left, his arm. It looks like, it looks like something from a, a mummy or something like that because it's wrapped up with someone with a broken arm, one or the other. And then you see on the right side the colors that he uses. I think the colors are what really make it pop, as well as the shapes. I mean, they work together, but the colors, you know, those deep reds, deep blues, and deep purples, they really make the, the actual shapes, they accentuate the shapes and make, make the, the picture pop a little more than if it were just gray or just black or something like that. And then you see the green at the bottom which makes me feel like they might be out in a farm. So it might be down in North Carolina or something like that, but we get the idea that he's around greenery or grass or maybe a field. Okay, we'll go to the next one. And then this one right here, to me it screams the blues. It's called Three Folk Musicians. And folk music could mean the blues or it could mean folk music. You know, like uh, Lead Belly. Lead Belly is one of the people we mentioned earlier, and he was a folk musician. He was not necessarily a blues musician, but a folk uh, musician. And folk is a general term, music of the folk, of the people. 
blues is, is more specific. But here we have, the reason why it makes me feel the blues is because I see blues in the back, in the background and also on them as well. And then the, with the guitars and the banjo, it gives me that feel that it could be the blues or it could be folk music, but it's definitely people from the country because of those overalls, those types of people. And then you see that you have three different faces and each one is totally independent of the other. Now the one on the white, um, on the right has a white mask on. I wonder what that means. And then it appears his eye is in the middle of his face, below his nose. Yeah, and then the guy in the middle has a, a green face, and you can see the influence of cubism on, on, his, uh, on his face, you know. Uh, his face looks more like a mask, an African mask. And then the guy on the left, his face is, is almost dismantled, if you check it out. He's got many different shapes. He doesn't really have a complete face. So that one is, to me, is very, very unique. And then we've got the clothing, the guy on the left, he almost has some kind of African garb at the top, which is different from the guy on the right who has more, more like overalls, right? So the, the guy out front is obviously the lead, and the guy in the middle, he's the leader of the group. All right. And just look at the colors and the, the shapes and how they're mixed and matched to create something new. This is what made him unique. Now let's go to the next picture. Okay, here is a more, if you know Romir Bearden's uh, work. Oh, by the way, we have to uh, correct the spelling of his name. It's Romir. It's Romir. Okay, so um, here with this photo, this is more of a traditional photo from his style. And this is obviously a jazz group at a club. And they're getting down. You can tell they're playing. That trumpet player up front is really, he's taking the solo. He's got the trumpet held up high towards the mic. And the rest of the musicians, they're right in sync with him. And they're right behind him, really supporting him. And so look at the drummer. Um, and this is one of the most, probably the most popular pictures that he's done or montages that he's done. Uh, people who are familiar with Jet Magazine or Ebony Magazine, I'm sure have seen this picture uh, used to promote different products. I remember seeing it when I was growing up. And uh, so I was, I was seeing his artwork when I was you know, 12, 13 years old. But this is the first picture that I saw that he uh, created. And so look at the drummer. You really get a sense that the, the drummer is, is more of a human than the others. The others seem like objects in a picture. The drummer seems like a real human. And the reason why is because the face of the drummer is from a real picture. And so that's why he stands out in terms of how his face looks. The others are more of a, a painting shape, like he actually drew it with his, his hand, where the drummer is like a real person because his picture was taken from either a magazine or from a newspaper. So he, 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 he has a way of making us pay attention to certain objects more than other objects, depending on what he chooses to use to accentuate their image. And in this case, like I said, it was a newspaper uh, or a magazine uh, photo that he decided to cut up. Where with the if you look at the guitar player right in front of him, he does not have that type of face. He has more of a face that was drawn. And again, look at the different colors that he uses. Very beautiful colors. All right, we can go to the next picture. And then here we have the three, four musicians actually performing called the Blues People. And they're, they're uh, performing and you can see that they're a real jazz group, not a blues group. They've got the tenor saxophone out front, the bass player. And what we want to 
also identify is how he uses black figures and understanding that he was very, very proud to be black and that this group of artists was in tune with that and they were about really focusing on positive black images as opposed to a lot of the other images which had, you know, um, derogatory images of black people. So if you saw something like um, Sambo or something like that, with the really, really bugged eyes and the really, really pink large lips and, you know, making some kind of face or smiling extremely, you know, wide. They were really working against that. They weren't interested in promoting that. And in fact, they wanted to promote uh, pictures that were more representative of the people who were living in those communities, such as themselves. So here he chose dark images that didn't necessarily have any facial expression. They were just dark black images. And for him to do that, that means that he was very proud to be African American. I'm saying this all to say that this is very, um, this was important to them during the Harlem Renaissance, that they were making sure that they let you see that they were proud to be black and that they were working against a lot of images that were saying otherwise, that they should not be proud. So that's important to note. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is another one with the jazz musicians. He, he, he created a number of these pictures with jazz musicians. Uh, it's, it's known that, it's actually not widely known, but it is true that he was uh, a distant cousin of Duke Ellington. And he also lived in Harlem. So he was around you know, a lot of these uh, artists and he was hearing the music regularly. And so here you have these musicians in a jazz club. It looks like a big band because of the number of horns on the right side. That's uh, typically uh, a big band to have a lot of horns. Uh, and then you have the drummer in the back and the bass player. And you see the guitar player in the back. And so now what he's doing, he's, he's having dark images with brown images. Uh, of course, people come in all shades, so he chooses to represent that in this picture. Now, a couple of the trombone players, if you look on the right side and look in the middle, one of them does not even have a face. He kind of just has like a brown uh, shape. So I don't know what that was about. Maybe he didn't like that guy. <laughs> but he, did, he doesn't get a face. And then you see the, the vocalist in the middle. She's dark skinned. And then she's got her hair and flowers in her hair. And so he chose to really represent her. And part of her is blue. So that could either mean that she was very dark or it could mean that she was singing the blues. Could go either way. And then what's interesting on the floor, you've got blue on the right side and you got red on the left side. I don't know what that was about, but then in the back you have green and red. It would make sense for the walls, but the floors are red and blue. So maybe they were, but that's very unique as well. And then um, let's go to the next one. Okay, and this is another one of the jazz uh, group groups. And uh, you've got the musicians performing, you've got the ladies singing, and I don't know if you see this, but there at the club on the wall is another picture by Romare Bearden, which I found that to be pretty clever uh, because the whole, what we're looking at is a Romare Bearden uh, painting, but then there's also the picture on the wall. So that was like a a little tongue-in-cheek action for, for everyone looking at the picture that he would paint a picture with his art on the wall. And so they're playing, they're singing. She's got her hand, hand up, which means she's hitting that note. 
I know you all probably watch sing, uh, some of these singing uh, television shows now where you see, you, you see the singer singing, and when they hit that special note, they usually put their hand up, so she's going in right there. And then the musicians are playing, and you see them going in. It's, very, it's like an action photo, or action painting, rather. Very nice. And then we'll go to the next one. Okay, and finally, here's a piece called Paris Blues Revisited. And this is a result of a collaboration between Romare Bearden, the writer Albert Murray, and the photographer Sam Shaw. And uh, Albert Murray and Romare Bearden were friends. Albert Murray is, was a Renaissance man of the time, very knowledgeable about black American culture, and also he knew what was going on in New York at the time. And uh, this montage is called Paris Blues Revisited because it's based on a movie called Paris Blues. In that movie features Duke Ellington, who's on the bottom left, and he's playing the keyboard uh, above his head, or there's someone playing the keyboard, and that's a direct reference to Duke Ellington because he played the piano. And then also Louis Armstrong was in that movie and you can see him in the middle. You can see his face, half of his face, and you see the trumpet directly in the middle at the bottom of the picture because he played trumpet. And then you see Louis Armstrong in the corner again on the right side, down on the bottom. Now, this is an example of how he mixed pictures with masks. If you look on the top right, that's an African mask that became a part of it. So just to give you a little history about France, France and jazz had a very symbiotic relationship. They really liked uh, jazz and, uh, and appreciated it. Uh, a big reason is because the Harlem Hellfighters, who I spoke about earlier in the uh, class a few weeks ago, they helped to free them from German rule during World War I. So uh, they had a lot to be thankful for, and they appreciated these Harlem Hellfighters for helping to free them uh, during the, the battles that they had. During uh, that time that the Harlem Hellfighters was in France, James Reese Europe was the band leader who brought and played jazz with a group for the French people. And so there became a love for each other's culture. And then you see with this, um, this picture called Paris Blues, Paris being the uh, big international city in France uh, that they love, love, love jazz uh, in I've actually played in France many times and played in Paris many times, and they just really love the music. And uh, their culture is a very, very uh, loving culture, and they love themselves, and they love jazz music, and it's, it's really amazing to be able to perform there. And so this is an homage to that relationship between the music and the people. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a documentary called Five African American Artists. This is from 1971. It features Romare Bearden and four other artists. Uh, I chose this documentary because I really want you to hear how Romare Bearden is speaking about his art. It's great to analyze art, but it's even better to, eat, to be able to hear an artist speak about their own art in the process that they go through to create the art that they make. So um, I wanted you to hear how he felt about it. And then later on, we'll hear how other people felt about it. But here we go. This is Romare Bearden speaking about his art in the documentary called Five African American Artists from 1971. Here we go. I think if the artist was the only person in the world, he wouldn't paint, because you paint in relation to other people. Suppose, for instance, a friend visited me and I wasn't here, and he left a card so that I would know he was here. And the things that I do 
I like leaving my visiting cards so that my work say Romy was here. Not long ago, a young artist picked up some of my visiting cards off the cover of Fortune magazine. He was going to the little gallery, the Sinke Gallery, named for the famous African prince who led a, a mutiny in the 1830s aboard a slave ship. I am on the board of directors along with uh, Norman Lewis and Ernest Critchlow. Uh, we three established this gallery to give needed exposure to minority artists. And uh, I think that uh, we have some little obligation to the young, deserving uh, people who are coming along. I really appreciate your coming over to see my work, Mr. Bearden. Everything looks just fine. I think it's one of our real fine shows that we had here. Uh, the uh, same movements that I see in the painting, I see continued in uh, some of your sculpture, like that piece over there. It's very similar to your painting. And it seems like you're very fond of this kind of undulating movement. So this uh, gallery uh, gives these artists a kind of a pat on the back. Of course, it was a little different when I started to paint, which was during the height of the Depression. I had been trained at first as a mathematician, but when I got out of college, there was nothing to count but the unemployed. So I took a studio on 125th Street above that of Jacob Lawrence. Uh, the great uh, poet and novelist Claude McKay was in the same building. And if we weren't at my studio, we usually went to the studio of uh, Charles Alston. We uh, met the artists and the intellectuals, and we had a real little going community. So this was a great deal in enhancing whatever development I've made as an artist. As for my own work, what I've tried to do is to take the elements of Afro-American life in this country as I see it. That is to uh, place it in a universal uh, framework. For instance, in my show at the Museum of Modern Art, I have a baptism scene. And I've tried to relate the people in my painting of the baptism to uh, a, a myth even back in Africa. I've used certain masks to try to show uh, the heritage that relates these people in my painting uh, back to a certain past. However, I constantly, uh, with the encouragement of my wife, who's helped me so much, try to reach within my own consciousness and memory and bring forth uh, our people that I've known and seen and uh, let them take their place on certain works that I'm doing. Some stand and some sit, some sleep, just what they want to do after the painting gets started. I use papers often that I paint myself, others I buy colored. I use uh, some photograph often from magazines, pieces of cloth and other material. In many ways, it's like uh, uh, putting a, uh, a symphony together or a piece of music, to a certain melody going of colors and then certain contrapuntal elements that play against this. Uh, one of my works I call The Block, and it's about uh, a particular block, 133rd Street in Lenox Avenue, that I've tried to, in my imagination, x-ray and tell something about the life of the people. This block is another calling card that I've left. I said, I've observed and passed by that I was here. Okay, now we're going to hear historians, experts, and personal friends of Romer Beard and talk about his art in a series that he created called A Black Odyssey. Here we go, A Black Odyssey. Romer Bearden was an American artist of the greatest importance whose innovations were many, but who's best known for his incredible collage work. 
He was an African-American who, through his art, told the epic story of African-America at the same time that he was so committed to telling the story of mankind in general. Romeo Bearden was born in 1911 in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, he died in 1988, so he went through a long life of changes in the United States, a lot of changes in the world. Um, he saw a lot. He was an African American who looked white to many people, and so I think he also learned a lot about humanity. He was a poet of Harlem who told that story. Uh, he was also a great Southern landscape painter. He gave you the interiors of, of spaces north and south, and when it came to the south, he made you think again about those breakfast tables and uh, passageways upstairs and uh, places where you'd bathe and cook and so on. And so without any nostalgia, he evokes scenes that people knew north and south, especially black Americans. I feel that what struck me about the Odyssey is that all of us, from, from the time we began to think, are on a Odyssey. In this case, home, looking for the values that are kind of everlasting, you know, when you are home, or Telemachus, the son, the search for the father. And, and, and this is applicable to everyone. Romar Bearden first created the Odysseus series for a show that appeared in 1977 at Courtier and Ekstrom Gallery on the east side in Manhattan. He'd been reading Homer for many years because he'd done the Iliad series in the 40s. And so he had been meditating on this for quite some time. I think he turned to the Odyssey because it was just like a love. It just was such a clear metaphor for the experience of African Americans and maybe his own experience. Homer's Odyssey is, is described as a great Greek epic that is a foundation of Western literature. It's the story of Odysseus and his trip back home after the wars. On his way back home, uh, Odysseus meets a series of gods and goddesses, especially goddesses, some of whom direct him on his way back home and rescue him. Others fall in love with this beautiful man and want him for themselves. The Odysseus series, when he asked me to come in to photograph him, um, and I saw him in his studio, I couldn't believe that a man did these. I thought maybe a machine had done them or they had been offset letho or something. The pieces themselves were so different than anything I'd seen before. So, uh, you know, it, it took me a little while to understand that he had actually done these. And I attended that show and you walk inside and you get a jolt uh, that here are these remarkable colors leaping out at you. The thing is, he did the watercolors uh, afterwards. So, in these photographs and the images that I took, he's at the table in St. Martin upstairs in his studio, and he's working on the Odessa series. And uh, he's already traced the outline, and he's just adding the colors to it. He's got the book from uh, the catalog from the show that he did. So uh, I'm sure he's looking to see what colors went into each piece. And uh, he's got his palette here and he's got his, uh, his inks, his watercolor, and he's just filling it in. Bearden makes the characters in Odysseus as black as he can make them. Here's an African-American artist telling a black story and making it unequivocally our story, purchasing the story as one for black America. We too are seeking home. We too have been through love and trouble and temptation and death and terrible suffering, and somehow we are the heroes of this story. There you get to hear from people who knew him and who saw his artwork. 
and they saw her firsthand. You, you got to hear from a photographer who was hired by, by Romare Bearden to photograph his artwork. So, um, you know, he talks about a story where he, he went to his uh, loft studio in uh, Soho, uh, back when Soho wasn't the Soho it is today. And uh, he and a gentleman he was working with, they brought up all this equipment all up these stairs, and they did all this, uh, he did all this photography, uh, you know, the old-fashioned way, and, and, and how he had, the first time he had photographed uh, the artwork, he didn't do a good job, and then he left, and he came back because he wanted to prove to Romare Bearden that he could do a good job, and he's a very young guy at the time, so he came back the next day, and then he did it again, he photographed all his artwork, and made sure he did a good job. What he said, I thought that was interesting, and I hope you picked up on this, that when he saw the pictures and the montages, he thought that a machine did it, or he thought someone, some kind of machine did it because of the consistency in the uh, shapes of the objects. Um, so that's something to think about because uh, nowadays people have computers and they can make any kind of object consistently uh, similar, right? You can make, they can put 100 objects on a square or rectangle and everyone will be identical, but he was doing this by hand. So he's drawing the shapes first and then filling them in with paint, different colors. Uh, so that's something to think about, that he had that consistency that he could draw with, with his hand. And, um, and again, he, uh, did you notice that the, the objects were just pitch black and they were comfortable with that? Um, and they were pushing back against the negative images that were made of them during that time. If you ever get a chance, just Google negative images of blacks from the 1920s and you'll know exactly what I mean when you see that. And he's making sure that it's black and that he's okay with it. And, you know, it's important to understand that they were fighting to be accepted and considered to be just as human as any other person. It wasn't about putting anybody down, that they just wanted to be considered uh, five-fifths, if you could understand where I'm coming from. Uh, instead of three-fifths. So that's important to note. Um, so that was Romare Bearden. Beautiful work. Now we're going to move on to Archibald Motley. Bring up Archibald. That's Archibald right there. Um, he was born on October 7th, 1891 in New Orleans, Louisiana. He and his family moved up to the northwest to Chicago, Illinois. It was in Chicago where he studied painting at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. After turning down a full scholarship to study architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, going to the next photo. Most of Motley's most popular works focus on nightlife among African Americans. The scenes often depict people performing, singing, dancing, drinking, and just having a great time. Here's a painting called Hot Rhythm. Okay, Hot Rhythm. For the people who don't know music, a rhythm is something that musicians play. And you can see the musicians are getting down, playing some kind of hot rhythm, and the people are loving it in the background. The beautiful ladies are watching the musicians and really enjoying themselves and dancing. And the guys are in the background, they're dancing as well. And then you can see the trumpet player, he's looking right at us while he's playing his trumpet. And then the only other object that's looking at us is on the left side toward the top, there's a guy with glasses on. And his mouth is being covered by the woman's arm. He's looking at us too. So they're playing hot rhythm, getting down into the music. And everybody's just enjoying it. The crowd is just immersed in trance with the music. Hot rhythm. 
And what I find with, with his paintings, he's very, very careful to really show the viewer how expressive everyone was in the midst of so much fun. Like you can see those facial expressions right in the middle of a feel, of a vibe. If you look above the trumpet bell at the guy's face who's dancing, I mean, look at his facial expression. It's like he's like right in between two facial expressions. So it's, it's a real a real feeling, and I'm sure that Archibald Motley was witnessing musicians perform and really seeing those raw, raw facial expressions right in the middle of the moment. And you can see how they just like going in. Look at the guy above the trombone. He is well, he's like right in the middle of, a, of some, some kind of feeling, and he captures that, that look before he relaxes his face and before he smiles and settles. But it's right in the middle of the moment. Okay, we're gonna to go to the next picture. Let's go to the next picture. All right. In this next photo, we see a similar scene, except here many of the people are resting and some are dancing. So this has been a real, real hot night. When you see some of the people resting, you know it was getting, it was getting good. And then some of the people are sitting down as well. And you can see that their arms are up. They're deeply entranced by the music and the moment. If you look way in the back, hands are up in the sky, right? So they're having a good time, really getting down and just feeling the music. And then you got the people at the bar, the two ladies at the bar, they're just relaxing. And if you look at the lady in the green, she's looking right at us under her hat. And then, as usual, you have the bartenders serving drinks and making sure that uh, everyone is served. So you got that bartender in the middle facing us. He's just looking at us, making sure everyone has a drink, I guess, right? Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now, this is a continuation of that painting we just saw. It's just a little more close up. So now you can see that the lady who was looking at us is actually not looking at us. She's looking at the man right there as he's talking to her. Sounds like, or looks like he's asking her to dance because he's got his arm out with his hand. And so what makes this painting and, and Archibald Motley's paintings uh, unique is that you feel like you're actually at the club or at the, in the moment of that experience, which is, which is different from Romare Bearden. With Romare's uh, paintings and, and, and collages, he's focusing on the individuals and really manipulating the look of the faces. With this artwork, you almost feel like you could hear the people talking to each other and that you could also um, hear the music. That's how descriptive it is that you feel like you're actually there. So that's important for you to know that these, these painters were really, really listening to the music and, and, and with a, in particular with Archibald Motley. I mean, really listening to the music, going to clubs, hearing the music, knowing the musicians, knowing how the people reacted to the music and then really capturing that and putting it into a painting. And uh, it's very unique. Let's go to the next one. Okay. This one right here is called Night Life. And then uh, this painting is a little more realistic in terms of the life that Archibald Motley lived. He uh, had many Caucasian friends, and in fact, his wife was Caucasian. So you can see that there's a mixture of people here in this painting. Uh, you've got all kinds of people sitting down, hanging out having drinks, and uh, oddly enough, in the middle of, of all that, we see a kid at the bottom eating an ice cream. You know, there's always one kid <laughs> hanging around adults, and uh, you see her at the bottom having her ice cream and looking right at us, but then you look way in the back, and then you see people dancing in the back. You see a barbecue, uh, barbecue meister, barbecuing the food, 
right? Right in the middle, you see the smoke coming up from the food. And then you see the balloons hanging from the top. So you get to feel that he was actually there, that he had created something based off of an experience that he had in particular. And then we go on to the next uh, picture. Again, he captures the musicians, the jazz musicians performing. And you have the couples dancing close to each other. Probably a slow song was being played by the band. And you can see the woman dancing with the gentleman on the right side, I'm sorry, on the left side of the uh, screen. She's smiling at the music, at the musicians, which means she liked the music a lot. So this music was very social music. This was music uh, that was a part of the people during this time, during the 1920s. You have to understand that jazz music during that time was what had the popularity and also had the connection to the people that hip hop has today. A very, very clear connection to the people. Jazz and blues, but uh, it had a connection, that's my point, to the people. The people loved the music. They felt they could identify with it. They felt it really spoke to them and their lives. And so what he did was he captured that. He captured this music that was a part of society in a very, very personal way. And you could see that they were enjoying it and it spoke to their lives. You have to think about that more than how you see jazz today is more on the sidelines as classical music is. And another thing was that jazz music during this time was music that was easily accessible by regular people who did not even study music. It's changed over time, and that often happens when you have intellectual music that gets studied by different people. But back here, but during these times, they just liked the music, and you know those people could have been people with regular nine to fives. They did not necessarily have to be avid jazz listeners, uh, as usually happens today. That you have people who are jazz enthusiasts that li that love jazz, but back then, just regular people loved and could be attracted to the music. So you have the, the band playing and you have the people dancing and everyone's having fun. Now, we're gonna move on to part one of a documentary on Archibald Botley. It's called A Stroll, A Walk, A Stroll. And uh, we're gonna just learn about Archibald Motley, so let's check it out and here we go. The Stroll. He really is one of America's premier modernists. You know, you want to be a part of this nightclub in Paris or a nightclub in Chicago. You want to be drinking at 1 a.m. and dancing and having a wonderful time. I'd like to call Motley the painter laureate of the black modern cityscape. When we talk about Archibald Motley, we're talking about an artist that is aesthetically a part of a particular moment in time, the early to mid 20th century. Archibald Motley was a product of the Art Institute of Chicago. And that school was a renowned school for educating um, students to the rules of, of color, of composition, of light, of um, just all of the things that a good artist knew. And as Picasso said, you had to know the rules in order to break the rules. And blues is a good example of Archibald Motley um, not only knowing how to paint in an academic, traditional way, but then improvising on that, having fun with that, altering it, um, pushing and pulling, so that you have these reds against whites, you have these blues against pinks. Uh, in fact, he's pushed against basic notions of, of, of representationalism. They are literally people of color. They, they have pink skins, they have magenta skins, they have blue-black skins. 
and, and, and so Archibald Motley, as I said, knows the rules and breaks the rules in order to make a major modern artistic statement. He adopted a style that's much broader, um, in some ways much less academic in nature. And, and you see it in blues, which is right behind me here. He is choosing to paint in this style because we know from his portraits that he was a master painter. So I think that this choice that he made to sort of break with academic convention was a way of approaching different audiences. There was a review done of um, blues in Chicago in the early 30s. And the reviewer who was based here in Chicago um, was kind of taken aback that Archibald Motley would be so brazen to take on a subject so risque and at the same time give it the seriousness of art. And so while there are transgressive elements in these works that, that perhaps rub very, very um, snooty people the wrong way, <laughs> I think many people vicariously were delighted and excited by the idea that here is an artist who takes on this subject and doesn't just do it in a, in a simplistic way, but does it in a serious way, treats it serious, and raises it to the level of a major modern artistic statement. All right, that was a documentary on Archibald Motley. I'll tell you a story about uh, Archibald Motley. When he was uh, attending art school in Chicago, you do realize that we're talking about the same period as the riots that we spoke about when we talked about Red Summer, okay, uh, in the beginning of the uh, course. So everyone knows that, uh, that Red Summer is when all the riots, the racial fighting and everything happened in Chicago. Well, Archibald Martley was, Motley was there during that time. And so uh, there was an instance in which one of these riots was near him, and uh, they went for him, the people in the mob. And he had a group of Caucasian friends from the art school that he attended in Chicago, and they backed the mob up from attacking Archibald Motley and uh, stood up for him and said, no, no, you're not going to you know, attack our friend, get back. And then they left Archibald alone. Uh, so that was something that I read that was pretty, pretty effective and, and left an impression on me. And also because uh, we tend, as we're looking at the art, you can really start to forget that there was all this other stuff going on at the same time while they were creating art because the art looks beautiful, right? The paintings are beautiful, lush colors, the music, you see the instruments, and they're having a good time. But, you know, maybe the night before there was a crazy riot during Red Summer and people got killed, you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, you want to really be aware of what was going on around the art because it helps you understand the art and also lets you know that his art could have been a real sanctuary for him and a place of peace. Uh, and also, you know, just knowing that his friend stuck up for him, we may, we may not have seen his art as we do today had that mob uh, got a hold to him. So that's something to think about and just to know about. We're going to also look at part two of the uh, Archibald Motley documentary called A Stroll. So we're going to go on and check that out right now. And let's, let's see uh, the stroll. A Stroll. So we're heading south from uh, Motley's Art Institute of Chicago, where he was a student and was trained. And we're heading south into the area um, that would later be called Bronzeville, that he represented so beautifully um, in his paintings. These, what he called these urban nocturnes, these street scenes, these night scenes. Um, he has, there's a quote from him saying that it was these night scenes where you find a lot of my race. That's what interested me. And that was for a reason, because um, as we head south and into what was become, becoming the stroll, um, it was a vibrant urban landscape. And, and you know, I, I, I like to call Motley the painter laureate of the black modern cityscape. Um, 
and he really reflected the energy, the dynamism, the action, the pace of uh, black urban living in the, in, in the face of real constraints, real racial constraints. I am also a figurative painter, you know, as Motley was a figurative painter. The neighborhood itself is a worthy subject for artwork, just as it was for Motley. Being in a neighborhood like this, it's a remarkable place. You know, it really is a remarkable place. You know, for all the challenges that one has to negotiate in a neighborhood, in neighborhoods that struggle economically, it's still it's a remarkable place and there's a there's a style of living there's a sound of life that is really appealing and satisfying to me i think uh, for myself as a young person uh, who first got the uh, idea uh, to be an artist uh, when i was a teenager uh, actually seeing work uh, by and of African-American artists is what began to legitimate the possibility. Seeing his work made me realize that there were uh, African-American artists. You know, this sense of uh, possibility uh, became real. It began to reaffirm the notion that I might in fact be this thing that I was thinking about being. It made me want to be a part of that history. And uh, for anybody who's looking to find connectors to today between uh, Romare Bearden and Archibald Motley, uh, check out the artwork of the gentleman who was speaking before this last one. His name was Kerry James Marshall and his art is coming right out of theirs in terms of the style. He has his own style, but it's built on the foundations of those two artists. So uh, get a chance to check him out, Kerry James Marshall. Uh, he was featured here in LA at MOCA um, in the summertime. Uh, but uh, you know, if you get a chance and you can go see his art, you'll see a lot of the similarities with the figures, uh, the black, pitch black uh, figures, human beings, uh, who are the subjects, and um, same type of approach. Not montages, but the actual dark objects. And, uh, and you can see his, his paintings are amazing. I saw his paintings in Chicago. Um, so yeah, so you can check that out. All right, so we're wrapping up our session on the painters, Romare Bearden and Archibald Motley. And we will see you next time. We'll see you online. And uh, looking forward. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye.